Welcome everyone. Today is our first of a few, I think it's five um, collaborations with CFRI and we're kind of doing this whole education exercise webinars um, on different categories within exercise. So hopefully if you like this one, this one's specifically about movement preparation cool downs, then eventually we're, I'm going to talk about strength, um, aerobic training or endurance training, and then kind of going from there. So if you like this, um, look out each month, we're going to do one for the next five months, and then you're going to have a full collaboration. So the big goal with this is to give you information that you can take home with you and then apply it to your own training or kind of create your own system within what we have used and seen um, at PPI that's helped our clients and stuff like that. So I'm gonna share my screen right now and um, go through kind of our whole setup of what's gonna to happen today. Um, and once again, I really appreciate everyone showing up for this. Okay, so my name is Taylor Lewis. Um, I will get into that in a little bit, but first I, I have to thank CFRI and all the various um, contributors to this seminar. It wouldn't be possible with ever without everyone in this whole collaboration. So I really, really appreciate um, what CFRI has done with us at PPI and, and whatnot. A uh, big thing I always tell people is what I say today and in future presentations, it's not take it with a grain of salt. Everyone is different. Everything is case by case and everyone has different criteria. So I always say, talk to your medical provider or team about things you may want to introduce and see if it's okay. If you've been cleared per the green light to go, then go ahead and implement it, but don't hesitate to reach out because sometimes things just don't fit in the same kind of arena at which you want to, which is not bad. We just need to, you know, look at more of a customized component here. And then who am I? Like I said, my name is Taylor Lewis. Um, I've been in the exercise uh, field for a little over 12 years now. Um, I started as a strength and conditioning coach in Northern California, where I'm currently based at Sonoma State University, working with the baseball team. Um, then I shifted to general population and private while still working with athletes. And then about nine years ago, I got into the CF community. Um, a doctor came to me and asked me if I would be interested um, and writing programs with CF. And so I kind of started to dive into the research of exercise in CF. And my whole goal over the past nine years is trying to bring exercise research that has already been done into the mainstream world in a sense. Because sometimes there's literature out there that can be very powerful for people, but unless they get their hands on it or know how to really break it down, then they may not be able to apply it as much or as well as they possibly could. So my goal is to kind of close that gap in a sense from the research to the application because if it's great when it's published but if we can't use it then what what power can i do for us moving forward um so the objectives today this is like i said just short webinar i'm going to go through the science portion um if you've seen me talk or have talked to me before i'm huge i really love the science behind exercise and what it can do for the body so I always wanted to kind of educate people or add some knowledge to people's kind of library in a sense of why these things work well, you know, because if you have a good why, then there's going to be a really good performance aspect and sustainability. Um, and then I'll have a question and answer. Uh, I'll ask, answer any questions that you have. And you'll also have my email and our, um, all our contact information. So if you have more specific questions, I'd recommend contacting me that way versus, and then let's really focus on the general aspect and stuff like that. And then I'm gonna demonstrate an exercise from each section that I'm gonna talk about today. Um, that's another key. I can tell you about these great exercises, but if it's not shown and implemented and show how it can work for you, then you may not get as much out of it. Um, and then at the end, you'll be receiving a four week program based on this whole criteria, which we're working with today um, through uh, the PPI or Perform Pulmonary Performance Institute's exercise app. You'll get an email about that and how you can access it. So you'll have all this stuff put into a program that you can do for the next four weeks, or if you wanna integrate portions of it into your workout and stuff like that. So the big question is why should you warm up? You know, there's, and once again, there's many ways to do it, but why are we going to kind of warm the body up before we get going when we exercise, especially when, when time's a factor, you may not have as much time. So you may not be able to spend that time. So you have to think is like, well, is a proper warm up 
going to be beneficial in the long run and stuff like that. Well, the big key I always tell people is beyond the exercises, it keeps you functional. It keeps you moving. It keeps you, it reduces that limited range of motion. It helps you move with ease and stuff. People tend to look at the core component of their workout and say, this is the reason why my, you know, lung functions increased or I'm moving better. I have more flexibility. That's one component, but we can't forget that the warm up and the cool down are just as powerful sections within your workout that you want to really focus on as well. Even though they're a shorter duration, you want to make sure that you keep that going because it's going to help keep you functioning well. Plus, when you think about it, when you are strapped for a little bit of time, you can utilize your warm up as you can turn it into a workout in a sense, and it can really help kind of drive that consistency forward um, when you're trying to keep the goal the goal. And then getting a little bit of the science aspect of it here, and I'm not going to go into really quantitative kind of detail of the numbers and stuff, because I want to be very, very general idea of the concepts of certain areas. And once again, there's various things that are going to help when you're talking about a warm up. But one big thing is we're talking about is increasing the blood flow. So we have a rate at which our blood circulates through our body. Now, when our heart pushes out that blood, that rate is then going to determine how much we're going to flow to the muscles and then repeat back up. So at a restful state, that is going to be slower than when we're exercising. So it's like, when you think about it, you don't just go out and start sprinting at maximal capacity. You need the systems to warm up. And one thing is we need to allow a low to, to harder progression of intensity to allow the blood to flow at a good rate. What that's going to do is want to think about there's this graph that I saw in a research article that I thought was very powerful. So all parts of your system utilize that blood for many different things, extracting oxygen, nutrients, whatever it might be. But if you think about this at rest, when you're really not doing anything exercise related or anything higher intensity, you'll see that blood, blood flow is distributed throughout the different organ systems. Now, when you start to integrate exercise and stuff like that, or you just increase the movement at which you're um, performing tasks, that blood is going to start to shunt away from different areas. And then it's going to focus on certain regions, like certain muscles that you're working and stuff like that. Um, one thing it's like when they, that whole saying is like, don't, don't eat at least 30 minutes before you go swimming. One of those kind of reasons behind that concept is when you eat, your body is shunting blood to your um, stomach to work on digestion. Now, if you're going to go swim and start to use your peripheral muscles, your arms, your legs, then it's going to have to shift over and start to send blood over to the, those regions. So then all of a sudden that's going to change things. And that's why sometimes people get kind of an upset stomach or they just don't feel right because once again, your body's trying to do multiple things at once. So this is very similar with warmups, you know, if our body is getting a lot of blood to multiple organs, we want to allow it the time to progress, to shift away from those organs, to focus on certain muscles. And that muscle blood flow distribution is going to change depending on what you're doing and the muscles that you're working. But I just like to show this because it shows you an idea of how much things start to shift based on what you're trying to accomplish here. And then it prepares a respiratory system. Uh, one thing it's like thinking about as if, you are gonna to go to sleep and start to hyperventilate, right? You don't work on excessive breathing right before you go to bed. You wanna work on slow, calm breathing to allow your body to kind of create that balance and go to sleep. Well, this is very similar to exercise in the sense is when you're trying to, if your goal is to get on you know, a bike or the treadmill and increase the respiratory rate to help pull oxygen into the body to utilize by muscles and the whole, uh, the systems, you want to allow it time to progress that. That's very key because if there's a sh quick, short distribution, it's going to be harder to perform optimally. And that's one thing that I talk about is like the goal of the warm up is to set yourself up for the best position for your workout, whether that's riding, whether that's lifting weights, whatever it might be, or going on a hike or something like that. It doesn't always have to be in the gym, it could be functional physical activity outside. What it's doing is it's per per preparing for those higher intensity bouts that you're gonna to need to use more oxygen and then vice versa. And here's another graph that kind of just gives you a general idea of what happens at rest. You'll see that your breathing is gonna be a little bit lower, but as you increase 
the demand for oxygen, it's gonna, it's gonna spike and then it's gonna start to increase. Eventually it plateaus depending on what you're doing. Um, but the whole concept here with this graph and this picture is to think that if we progress the system accordingly and not jump too fast, then we're gonna have an optimal potential for better gains in the end. So think about that when you're warming up, it's not just to feel better, it's like you wanna get the internal systems revved up, ready to go. Another thing is increases muscle temperature. Like I had said, when you increase blood flow to the muscles and other regions, it starts to change the temperature of the body to get things working properly. Another thing is since it's a slower rate, sometimes certain muscles don't have the same blood flow that they need when they're at rest to physical activity. So that's also gonna help to increase the core temperature within to help get you prepared for the task at hand. And then just like anything else, increase joint range of motion. So if you see, I like this picture because it gives you, shows you an idea of just all this musculature and then you have some fascial tissue and there's all this blood flowing within this system. And if you're working multiple muscles, say it's a full body workout, it's HIIT training, what's, whatever it might be, you want to make sure that your joints are moving well. And this is one thing when we talk about your joint, what happens is if you wanna get proper biomechanics or move with efficiency, you need to allow the muscles to work accordingly. And it's just like, if you're cold or something like that, well, a good analogy, like I say, is like, say you wake up um, in the morning, you tend to be a little bit more stiff, um, sometimes aches and pains, depending on what's occurred before. And then once you get up and start moving around a little bit, you start to loosen up a little bit. And that's very similar to with the warm up and increasing joint range of motion. When you get some blood flow going, you're starting to see yourself move a little bit with, with better ease in a sense. And then that's going to allow you to perform exercises or reps at a better efficient rate and stuff like that. It's just like working out stiff. It's really hard to push the levels of weight or push yourself on the treadmill or cycling outside when your body's a little bit stiffer. So you wanna really prepare the system for what's about to happen. My big thing is going back to the functionality is everyone has different goals, okay? Some, I work with clients that they just wanna move better because they wanna be able to dance with their grandchildren at their, at the, at their wedding. Um, or their parents, you know, hanging out with family more and stuff like that. Others, it's exercise related where you want to improve, you know, your one mile run. Um, others just want to feel better and breathe better and breathe with more ease. Another thing that we forget about sometimes is we have a lot of responsibilities outside of exercise, daily life, um, and personal stuff where sometimes we need to be able to function with better movement. So if we have to pick things up, grab a, a glass from the top cupboard or bend down to pick a fork off the ground, you want to be able to move with a little bit more ease and fluidity. So then later on, you don't cause any stiffness or put yourself at a, a risk for injury. And that, that's a big key with these things too, is preventing risk of injury. And one easy way to do that is preparing your body properly before your workout. So warmups. So I'm gonna go through what we at PPI like to do in a, a general criteria um, of things that we'll target, target in a warmup. Now, when we talk about the soft tissue and stuff like that, um, we always like to have people do some type of foam rolling. Now, if people don't have foam rollers, you can use a tennis ball, a baseball, lacrosse ball, something, you know, a, a massage stick, something that helps just kind of roll the tissue out a little bit. Um, it's always good because it makes kind of helps increase that range of motion, helps with blood flow. And one thing from a science standpoint, this is kind of just a general picture of a skeletal muscle. And you'll see within this kind of golden region is actually like fascial tissue. And you'll see within these, these there's layers stacked on each other. And within those layers, there's layers of fascial tissue that go. Now, when you're rolling, foam rolling, doing some type of self, soft tissue massage, um, what that allows does it helps kind of release the tension sometimes in the muscle. So sometimes you'll have this connective tissue kind of stick within the muscle or stuff like that. Sometimes people call them adhesions or different things. But what happens is when you roll and put pressure there, it can help release and kind of get things to flow a little bit better. So foam rolling can be a very powerful thing pre and post workouts to help get your body moving a little bit 
uh, easier and stuff like that. Now, if you don't have a foam roller, that's, that's fine. That's just something to do. But I always recommend people, if they can get a baseball, lacrosse ball, softball, something to do a little bit of rolling if they don't have a foam roller. And foam rollers are fairly, you know, relatively cheap in a sense, you know, that you can order off of online or something like that just to keep it home. Um, it, we have clients actually do it before respiratory treatments and they feel like they have, a, they do their treatments with a little bit more ease and stuff like that. So something to, to think about to start your workouts. Now, after we have clients do some uh, rolling and some soft tissue work, I always like to, well, we always like to work on respiratory training before. Now, there's a lot of science behind different breathings from Eastern to Western type modalities. In the beginning of warmups, you wanna be more conscious of what your goal is for that task at hand. And when we do respiratory treatment before, there's really a specific goal. So we really want to concentrate on realigning the breathing with our movement. And oftentimes, depending on when you exercise, um, sometimes you'll go into an exercise already upregulated. Your respiratory system's in a little bit heightened state, maybe stress. Um, you haven't had a lot of time throughout the day, a lot of different errands, or maybe you're just also very low parasympathetically state. You're kind of just like, I'm walking through the motions. You feel very relaxed. Well, what we like to do is integrate a couple exercises, respiratory training to get the system ready for conscious support of what's about to happen. So we wanna regulate the breathing in and out and increase it just like we talked about in the warm up, slowly increasing that respiratory rate. But not only that is respiratory training can help work with posture. It helps work with lung function. Your respiratory muscles are also your postural muscles, which means if your respiratory muscles aren't working at an optimal rate at that moment, it's gonna change your posture. And when your posture changes, it's gonna change your workout. So once again, you'll see everything's integrated and stuff like that. And I'll, I'll be going through one of these exercises that we do. And the, the big key from Eastern modality to Western that we focus on is really focusing on big, inhalations and really forced exhalations versus trying to work on the flow. And we'll go, I'll be going through that with you. So always start soft tissue work, some breathing and what I like to call movement preparation. So we're preparing the body in certain regions to do more of a gross big pattern exercise like lunges and stuff like that. So depending on your day, depending on your postures, like I said, that's going to slightly, that's not going to dictate, but it's going to directly affect how your body moves. So if I sit a lot, my glutes are going to be a little bit more weaker. So during the movement preparation, I would focus a little bit more on glute activation or glute movement preparation to be able to fire, knowing that I just sat for six hours working. So I need to kind of realign my system, get everything working well, so then I can set up for the next thing. These exercises tend to be a little bit more isolated as well. So we wanna make sure that we're not necessarily going full body yet, because once again, when we work multiple joints at once, then all of a sudden there's many muscles working. And if one's slightly off, or it's not working as well or efficient as the other one, then there's gonna be some discrepancies on how our body is gonna be functioning. And that's also gonna affect your heart rate, your respiratory rate, because once again, those systems work to help you move and so if it's a little bit more difficult, that's going to kind of increase a little bit. So sometimes preparing the body for your workout, you'll start to see strength gains increase, endurance, aerobic uh, endurance increase for those workouts, just because you made it easier to move through those, uh, the movement patterns in which you uh, are doing for that day. And always think, we always like to start ground to standing from the ground and then stand up. Once again, gravity is involved, physics is involved. So when you're on the ground, it decreases that. And so you can really target specific regions at which you want to um, activate and get moving well. All right. So I always tell people too, is start proximal to distal or spine to limbs. So here's a perfect example. We want to think we always start inner to out. The big reason why is the whole, the spinal cord, everything, the core, your foundation is which is within this big region here. And so the closer we are to the system, if it's slightly altered and we start to work on the, the peripheral limbs, then that's not going to function well because once again, our foundation isn't level. It isn't at the balance of which we want to create it. So we always want to start thinking working exercises in to out when we're talking about preparing the body. 
And then from there, you go into the di dynamic. That's the multi-joint exercises. Those are the ones, the lunges, the side lunges, the butt kickers, things that are going to be gross pattern. So you'll see we isolate and we start with certain areas to activate and then we bring it all together as a unit to work more efficiently and effectively. And once again, it really depends. I always tell people when we're talking about warmups here, you don't, if you have, let's say an hour, not everyone does, but it's just a general 60 minutes here. You don't want to spend 20, 30 minutes warming up because then you only have 30 minutes to cool down and do whatever you want. So you want to keep it short but you want to be precise on what you're doing and you want to make sure that you don't fatigue the body too, too much, or you don't want to fatigue it before you go into the main lifts or the main component of your workout. So be very cautious when you're doing that. Cause sometimes people warm up too much a lot. You'll also see people don't warm up enough. So you want to find that kind of sweet spot. Think of it like kind of like an hourglass. When you tip that hourglass over, there's only so much energy your body has for that, that workout. So don't spend all the time doing the warm up if you have another thing or component that you want to work on. And then I always tell people, keep it multi-directional. So we walk in a linear path, but our body rotates, it flexes. It does this three-dimensional movement patterning when we're doing everything that we do. Now, the degree at which it performs in that kind of plane of motion is dependent on the task. However, when you're warming up, you want to make sure that you're kind of hitting all three dimensions of what the body can do. So forward to backward, side to side, or rotating. So when you're looking at your warm up, see if it's multi-directional or if it's linear. So for example, someone that does re reverse lunges and then forward lunges, that's pretty much just straight forward and backwards. They, they miss the side to side and the rotational. And depending on your um, exercises or what you're going to be doing that day, that could hinder it a little bit. You may feel warm, but you want to make sure your body is always moving through three dimensions. So you want to make sure that you kind of engulf your warm up with plentiful different directions at which you move. And then just a quick overview and stuff like that. Warm ups, 10 to 15 minutes. Um, you, like I said, you keep them shorter comparatively. Um, once again, this is time dependent. If you only have 30 minutes, you may end up doing a five to 10 minute warm up. You know, I don't recommend doing less than five minutes um, just because warm ups are extremely powerful for what you're about to do. So you want to make sure that you don't skip out on something just because you want to add something because that kind of can start to increase risks of things like injuries or you know postural discrepancies that start to cause pain down the road or stiffness and stuff like that. You wanna be able, to, you're looking for longevity here. So you don't wanna do a quick warm up and then all of a sudden you're stiff for the next three days and all of a sudden it just, it just changes the dynamics of future workouts. Progress the intensity, start low and then you increase it. So you'll see people that are starting to do more higher demand like you know, 20 yard butt kickers, high knees, jogs, this and that, that starts to increase the level intensity. So you want to start off a little bit less than that. So you can allow your body to understand the forces um, that are going to be applied to the body. So you don't increase that risk of injury or a quick uh, tweak of something. And then, like I said, ground to standing is always a great way to do that from the ground up. Now, if you can't start on the ground, start standing and just start stationary. Once again, there is modifications based on what the goal is or what you can do. And then I always tell people, make it specific to the goal. Okay, so for instance, if you're going to be focusing on doing strength training for the legs, you might want to integrate a little bit more warm up based on legs versus upper body, right? So if you warm up the upper body, but don't do any leg exercises to warm up, and then you go do back squats or lunges, that's not going to necessarily give you optimal um, setting points to be able to improve. So think of what the goal is, and then start to mirror things within those movements that kind of will help prepare you. It's almost like you're doing practice repetitions or sets for what you're about to do. So back squats, then maybe you do body weight squats for some, just to get that kind of movement pattern down. And then just a warm up of the summary. Like I said, the big thing here um, is this picture quality over quantity. Don't speed through it. Always make sure it's quality. Cause once again, you also have to think you're warming up the body but your brain is also taking notes of how you're moving. 
And if you keep moving the same way, and let's just say for some reason, you're like, I want, I want to do 20 reps, but 10 to 20 is not as optimal. Your brain starts to take notes of that. And then all of a sudden you start to mimic those poor movement qualities. And then it turns into more of an unconscious, unconscious and some subconscious behavior slash habit. And then it's like, well, why do I have knee pain and stuff like that? And then if you take a step back and look, oh, I was preparing my body, but I wasn't potentially doing it the quality at which I could. So then your body started to change. It's very similar like with postures and how, you know, if I sit here for eight hours and I stand up, my posture is not going to get to upright. It's not going to give me necessarily a standing position because my body's like, okay, you've sat for eight hours. I'm not going to just reset the system. So really think quality over quantity. I, it rev, it'd be better to be short warm up with higher quality than to be able to do a longer warm up with the, qual, the quality going down. So really think about that. And then once again, you do movement prep, dynamic, and then you keep moving forward. And I'm gonna be going through a couple of these exercises. And if you have questions, throw them in the chat and um, I'll get to them when we get to the Q and A. So let's go to the cool down. Why should you cool down? You know, especially time dependent. Once again, oftentimes, say we're on the treadmill or riding the bike or just going, you know, something a little bit moderate intensity, we tend to stop and don't, sometimes we leave because we have to get going. There's always a new task that needs to be um, attended to. So we have to really think that we need to give ourselves time to cool down. And five minutes isn't that much in the big scheme of things if we really understand the power of what a cool down can do for us. So we, it's here to regenerate a balance. So like I talked about in the beginning with the warm up, we really increase heart rate, increase respiration rate, increase blood flow. There's a lot of increasing going on. Now, when the workout's done, we don't just, you just if you stop, it's still it's gonna take time to regenerate. So allowing a slow progression back, just like it's an inverse with a warm up, you slowly increase. A cool down is now let's slowly decrease to get back to that resting balance there. And it's gonna help a lot of things when we do that. It helps improve recovery because once again, we're allowing the blood flow to kind of slow back down, allowing the respiratory system to regenerate and kind of get back on page, kind of rev the system down. It's you drive a car super fast, you just don't slam on the brakes and stop. If you do, it's possible, but over time that puts wear and tear on the systems and that can cause stress to the body. So you have to really make sure that the questions like, is my cool down adequately enough for what I'm trying to accomplish? Obviously the higher the intensity, maybe the longer the cool down. If you're just going for a 20 minute walk and a very low intensity, you may not have, you may not sit there and cool down for 10 minutes. So it's very, intensity dependent, but give yourself time to get the system down before you take on the next task. Um, it reduces muscle stiffness and soreness. This is where I was talking about the foam roller and stuff like that. When you add some you know, soft tissue work to it and help the blood flow recirculate in the region that are needed, it's gonna help with the recovery process. It's always good to finish a workout and feel like you got a lot out of it, but you wanna really let the system down just to reduce potential soreness and st stiffness. And it's been shown that if you added some soft tissue work in days later, the reduce of soreness, you'll have a increase in reduce of soreness comparatively to someone that just walks out the door and doesn't do anything. So you wanna think, I'm trying to recover because you're trying to set yourself up for the next workout and then the next workout. And this is why warmups and cool downs are very important because it's not just about today. It's about tomorrow or the next day when you go into that next workout. Because if you're always sore and stiff and just battling through workouts, you're never going to reach optimal capacities because your body's still trying to recover. So listen to your body and take some time. Once again, if you're doing soft tissue work like rolling, you know, full body is always good, 10 to 20 rolls. Just find the regions that you feel are sore or the regions that you work that day. Once again, if you're working legs, spend a little bit more time doing some soft tissue work there versus the upper half. If you have more time, really hit every region of the body. Static stretching is always a good way because it's very low intensity and stuff like that. I always tell people target full body, but if there's if you lifted upper body that day, maybe spend a little bit more time on upper body stretches, going back to specific, specific regions that you're working that day. So everything doesn't always have to be the same. 
It doesn't have to be so black and white. Every muscle has to be stretched the same because you'll, you've probably already know you have certain muscles that are a little bit tighter than others. You're going to be sore in certain muscles rather than others. So you want to make sure you start to think about where are these regions and let me start to attack them in a way that's going to be very uh, beneficial. Um, well, one thing I said with also low intensity walking. So if you're not, if you don't want to stretch necessarily, or if you're really hypermobile, that's another thing. If you have lots of flexibility, maybe just going for a five minute low intensity walk or doing a five minute uh, cool down on the treadmill, just very slow. That's another way to cool the system down. Once again, it's not just about the muscles. It's about the cardiovascular system, the cardiopulmonary system. We want to kind of get everything to slow down to kind of set us up for our ne next task at hand. And then I always like to work on more of Eastern China respiratory training in a sense. This is where the difference in the warm up versus the cool down comes in place when we're talking about respiratory training. So during the warm up, it's very specifically goal oriented to really increase that intensity of breathing and really focus more on a postural aspect. So muscular skeletal dynamics of how your body moves. This is more getting the whole system down, letting it get back to a good normal resting heart rate, bring down the respiratory system and let your body just breathe. This is a time where if you wanna lay in the ground, close your eyes and do nasal breathing or just very slow, long breaths, this is the time to do it. Or sitting, if you're at the gym, you don't wanna lay on the ground, just sit there and breathe for a minute. Let your systems get back to that normal position. And then once again, cool down. Soft tissue work is great to do. Static stretching is always good because once again, if you're trying to improve strength or if you're trying to improve the, your movement capacity, you need some form of range of motion that's gonna be optimal for those joints. So if you're stiff, go for a run, you'll see there's gonna be a difference than when you're not stiff. So you wanna make sure you're targeting these things and then just let the system down, let it kind of get back to a normal realm with the respiratory training. And the good thing too, when we talk about this respiratory training with a cool down, you're training the system to downregulate efficiently and effectively, right? Just like we did in the warm up to increase efficiently and effectively. If you improve the rate at which you recover, it's going to leave some in the tank for later, but it's also going to optimize that. So then you can push the elements later on. So it's all about upregulating in the warm up and then downregulating in the cool down and being able to master that in a way that allows you for optimal gains. So since you're able to stick through this, which I really appreciate everyone doing, everyone that's registered, um, you will be getting probably within the next 24 hours a email from the Pulmonary Performance Institute. Um, about a four week warm up and cool down program. Now, how this program is um, set up, it's online. Our exercise app is right here. You can download the app right now if you would like on your phone. Um, you won't have a login until you get an email, so you won't be able to log in. Or once you get the email, you can log in through your computer. It's also, you can log in through a tablet as well. It's a three day a week, four, four week program that's integrated the, so, the soft tissue work, if you, you have the ability, it has the respiratory training, some movement preparation, some dynamic exercises, and then it has a cool down. So let's say you're doing already a strength training program or an endurance based training program. What you can do with this program is you can implement the warm up section and the cool down section within that. So if you feel you want to try a new warm up or try something different and see what works for you, this is the best kind of, this is a, an avenue that you can kind of go down to integrate more of a, a well-balanced program. Another thing too is say you're not doing a program right now, you're just kind of getting back into things. Well, this could be something good to start, you know, get the system going because you don't want to just jump into the deep end right away. And then all of a sudden you're stiff, you're sore, and you have to take multiple days off. This could be an easy preparation to um, increase to what you, to your future goals and stuff like that. Another thing you can think about doing is you can add sets or rounds to this to create a workout. So like I talked about not having your warm up as a workout. Well, if you don't have a strength training routine, you don't have an endurance routine and you just kind of want to improve some strength and you want to kind of optimize your body's way to move. 
you can turn this into a workout by just doing multiple rounds of it. And it's an easy way to do a body weight kind of workout program at home. So that's another way you can look at this. Um, it's about 10 to 20 minutes, depending on, you know, the levels, depending on your recovery and stuff like that. There's video instructions of every exercise. We have over 400 videos and the goal with these videos was to set them up. So if we never talk again, you have instructions and healing and how to do the exercises. Um, and then you can also reach out to me. You guys will be put into the CF exercise group. This is gonna be a group for everyone that's registered. So I have your information and there'll be a discussion board so we can chat on there. You'll also have my personal email or work email that you can utilize if you have questions more specifically towards you. I always tell people, don't hesitate to reach out. I'm here to help. I'm here to answer questions. Um, you know, I don't know everything, but I think I can help guide you in certain regions if you're open to it. So don't, don't hesitate to throw stuff on the discussion. And then we get this chat going and then all of a sudden we have 20 people talking about certain things and then things start to open up a little bit. So don't be hesitant to be very active on the the platform and that's kind of what it's built there for this community of people that you've taken your time out to listen try and learn a little bit more so um, more than you know happy to answer anything you have so here is all our social media stuff and contact information my email is at the bottom there so like i said if you have more specific questions if i didn't answer something that you may want to talk about don't hesitate to email me there these are all our social media sites. I always recommend if you can follow them, um, like them, because we try to sit, put more content out there that may be viable for you, that it's be something that you're looking into. Um, so I will um, put these back up at the end of this. Um, if you don't have it, take a screenshot picture, but don't hesitate to reach out. Let's see here, we're on the home stretch. So I appreciate everyone for spending your time on uh, today going through this with me. Um, and I'm excited for what's about to happen over the next four to five months. Because once again, this exercise education for CF is very powerful. When you understand a little bit more about how you move, how you prepare, it's going to be, it gives you, you know, tools to create precision. And when you have precision, you're going to be able to really target your goals a little bit better. So questions and answers. So I need to put a couple re references up. These are from the, the images and stuff like that. But I'm going to unshare my screen. And if you have a question in the chat, I'll, I'll answer it. And then I'm going to do some application stuff because I believe that the biggest way is to show you. So when we talk about inhalations and exhalations, we want to focus on nasal inhalation okay now you can do all nasal breath inhalation exhalation you know that's that's great if you're good at that phenomenal um if you can't breathe into the nose obviously do mouth breathing okay if you're obstructed or there's just it's just not feasible for you because once again we're warming the system up so if you're super stressed trying to get air in through the nose you're going to tighten in places so find the optimal position or mechanism to be able to do the breathing because we're trying to slowly elevate and increase. So if it's hard from the get go, you're gonna to jump too soon. All right, so when you breathe in, I want you to try and get to the point where you're a three to six second or six count inhalation. In through the nose. And then when you exhale, three to six count out through the mouth as it in pursed lips. So and when you think you have all the air out, at the end of that exhalation, I want you to try and get more out. So at the end, it's going to be that's what we're look, looking for the um, exhalation, in range exhalation. Now, the reason why we're doing this is we're trying to get the diaphragmatic system working on a playing field that's going to put us in a position to lift heavy weights or run, whatever it might be, okay? So these exhalations, we're trying to get all the air out. So then when we inhale again, we're really able to optimize. Now, when you're working on that inhalation, you wanna think about when you inhale, you want all the pressure to go all the way down to your pelvis. So you almost wanna feel at the bottom of your pelvis, right at that pelvic floor, get tightened up a little bit. Because once that pressure goes all the way down, it's gonna come back, but 
since you've already put, since you're pushing pressure there, it's going to push pressure out. And this is where we start to get this whole trans diaphragmatic breathing, this whole 365 degrees. So we're not excessive here and we're not just belly breathing here. I want your whole abdominal system to expand. That's when we know we've created this good pressure system. Okay. So I think three to second inhalation, three to second exhalation. Now, one more thing on the exhalation. When I talked about breathing out through pursed lips, I like to also tell people that it may work for you. Is think about as if you have straw in your mouth and you have 42 cupcakes in a row. And there was one candle in each cupcake. And your goal when you exhale was to blow out every single candle in one line. So they're not lined up here. You're not going here. I'm going to try and get that 40 second candle out in one breath. So it's get that 40. And then all of a sudden, that's when you're going to start to feel activation in this abdominal region. And that's when we know we're kicking things in. So we're trying to get all that bad air out, all that CO2 out, and then allows us more in the tank. And this is where we're going to start to utilize oxygen better. And then all of a sudden, our blood flow is going to start to increase. And now we're taking the system to the level at which we want to go. Okay. Now, that's the breathing aspect. When I also talked about the warm-up with the breathing, we're doing it to help with posture. We're help trying to get the diaphragm to work functionally, which is then going to tell all the muscles around it, hey, it's time to kick in and do your jobs, but in the positions that are needed. Now, sometimes with CF, we already have an exaggerated breathing rate. Okay? We're a little bit more sympathetically driven, so we're going to really drive into extension. We're going to flare the ribcage up. And that can start to kind of compact almost the ribcage in a sense where it's going to be harder to get this anterior to posterior expansion. Because your ribcage expands and then turns in and out. And the same here, expands up and then expands down. And we want to make sure we can allow that to happen effectively and efficiently because if it isn't, then you're not going to get as much air. Okay. So this exercise is called quadruped rib ties, where we're going to work on when we inhale, we're going to be in the squadron position. We want our hands stacked under our shoulders. We want our knees stacked under our hips. You can either relax the toes or you can tuck them under. Whatever's going to feel the most comfortable. Okay. Now, with your hands slightly outside of your shoulders, so I don't want them right inside, I want them slightly outside. Now, your weight should be through your palms and the knees. And what that's going to look like is, I want to be here versus back there. I want to be vertical with where my weight is going. Okay. I'm going to breathe in through the nose. And when I breathe in, I want to feel the pressure go down to my pelvis. I want to feel my pelvic floor start to tense up a little bit. I want to feel that pressure down here because I want to eventually feel this. When I exhale, I'm going to tuck my rib cage. So I'm just going to show you real quickly. I'm tucking my rib cage down the back, which is going to round me. The reason why we're doing this is because people are like, well, I'm already rounded, why am I doing this? I'm trying to work on posterior expansion of the rib cage, which often gets tight and it doesn't allow us this anterior posterior expansion. So we're going to be here. I'm just going to do three breaths. If you want to do it with me, you can. So I want you to think inhalation for three to six. When you exhale, tuck your rib cage, hold it there, and then you're going to try and breathe in again. And then tuck more, hold it there, breathe in again, and tuck more. So each time we're going to try and round more, more, and more. All right. So set up in your quadruped position. All right. Inhale. In through the nose. And when you exhale, first lift. Tuck the rib cage. Get all the air out. Then stay there, try and breathe in again. And then exhale, tuck more, tuck more. Hold that position, breathe in again. And then exhale, hold that, exhale. And then slowly relax the body. Now things you could have felt there, 
You could have felt crackling in the upper back. You could have felt some tightness right here under that clavicle, first rib, an area that tends to get tight. And what we work there is we lock the rib cage down. So the only thing we could do with a locked rib cage is expand here and expand here. Because if I can't do this, which tends to happen in secondary respiratory breathing, then if I'm here, the only thing that I can do is boom, let my ribs expand. So then when we breathe and expand, we get better thoracic expansion versus thoracic extension and then neck and all this other tightness. So just quickly again, quadruped position, in through the nose, when you exhale, tuck and exhale as much as you can, hold that position, and then you repeat it for three to six breaths. Then you want to take 10 to 30 seconds off. This is neurologically driven, which means we're changing the patterns. So we're flooding messengers to the body to allow it to get things to work. So it needs time off. You may not feel fatigued muscle-wise, but you want to allow the brain a little bit of time, okay? So keeping the same ground position, once I got a little bit better expansion, once again, that proximal to distal, I started on the spine, now what I'm going to do is that multi-directional rotation aspect, like I said, we don't just move in a straight line. Our body rotates, all right? Our arms swing and it makes us rotate. So I need to work on thoracic rotation. Now, if you have bad knees, you can go into a half kneeling position, okay? But ideally, well, I like this quadruped T-spine rotation with lumbar walk. What that is is, we sit back, which is going to allow our lumbar spine to lock up a little bit here or stay stable because we don't want our lower back to move. We just want to focus on this upper half. I'm going to plant my hand on the ground. I'm going to take my other hand. So my left hand's on the top of my head. I'm going to take the tip of my elbow and I'm going to try and rotate and touch my bicep or where my elbow flexes. Okay? I'm going to put my hand here, tip of the elbow, to the inside of the bicep. Then I'm gonna rotate away and I'm gonna follow, my eyes are gonna follow the tip of my elbow. And I'm gonna come back in. And you see I'm going nice and slow. None of these exercises are speed related. Because once again, I'm trying to let the spine start to move. And if I go too fast, muscles around it are gonna tighten up because the goal is to reduce any risk of injury. So I want to make sure that I don't go too fast. I'm just going to show you a couple on the other side. Plant, hand, and you'll see sometimes one rotation. For me, when I rotate this way, it's a little bit stiffer, or I feel as if it lacks a little bit of the rotation. So when I was talking earlier about how everything doesn't have to be balanced, I'm a huge advocate on if you have a side that's a little bit lacks the range, do a few more. So I could do five on this side, but then I could do 10 on this side. So it doesn't have to be the same balance. Your body's asymmetrical, which means you're gonna have more range in certain regions. So you just kind of balance that out. So now we've increased expansion. We've added mobility. Well, I always tell people we need to lock that in. What I mean by that is, if we add degrees of motion or I improve my range of motion in my shoulder, if I don't tell all the muscles that help stabilize it within the joint, this new range, it's gonna tighten back up because we're trying to help reduce risk of injury. So once we've done mobility, we're gonna activate the core a little bit. And I want you to think about activation of the core differently than sometimes you see where we're gonna hold a plank for a minute. I actually want to do short durations, higher volume. So what that would mean is you do a 10 second plank, relax for 10 seconds, and you repeat that for six times for a total of 60 seconds versus only for trying to do it for a minute or 60 seconds, one time. The reason why, when you walk, when you move, when you function, are you always tense the whole time? No, the body tightens, relaxes, repeats, and creates a rhythm. So we want to train the core that way because they tighten, relax, tighten, relax. 
So core training should be like that. So since we're only at the warm up, even if you're advanced level, it's always good to kind of shorten the levers and really target a region. So when I have my knees bent, my elbow stacked under my shoulder, and then I lift up into the side bridge, some people call it side plank. Now I'm activating the core muscles on my abdominal, the bottom left side here. Hold this for 10, and then I will relax. Wait 10 seconds, and then I lift up and I repeat. Now the key with this is once again, especially if you're a little bit more intermediate and advanced, like 10 seconds is easy, that's fine. Remember, warm up is just warming the system up. It's not trying to challenge us. So if you want to hold longer, throw that into your workout. We just want the muscles to know what we're about to do to a certain degree. So we do 10 second holds, lift and then relax, okay? If you want to challenge yourself, you can lift up and work on breathing, nasal breathing. In through the nose, out through the mouth. Because now you're working on breathing while in an isometric position, something the body does functionally. You're getting it ready. All right, so like I said, we started on the ground. We targeted regions. Now I want to put it all together. So one exercise that I really like people starting out doing is reverse lunges. I always tell people when they start standing to start stationary, which means Stay within a region and then start to do it a little bit more dynamically and stuff like that. Okay, so what happens since I've warmed the system up, I'm going to lunge back, keep 80 to 90 percent of my weight on this front leg. All right, so I want to make sure that when I drive up, I'm going here versus I'm going here. I don't want to go vertical because eventually I'm moving forward. Okay, so what's going to happen? I'm just getting a little closer. Tall chest, lunge back. You'll see my knee's going to bend forward. Don't let your heel come off the ground because you want your weight here. And then lunge up, chest up. So you'll see all the muscles here that I worked on before are now controlling where my hips and my body is going. And that's very key to the warm up. So that's straightforward. Then I can throw in easily just static position, side lunges, shift. I'm moving this side to side. And then there. Once again, I'm working this side to side movement and allowing me to move forward. So those are two just very simple exercises. In the actual program, there's I think four to five dynamic exercises that takes you multi-directional, okay? This is just a short glimpse into this progression. And then each week, the exercises will change slightly. I think it's every two weeks, you'll see a big difference, but there's slight changes every single week. So by the time the four weeks is over, then all of a sudden you'll have multiple exercises to throw in your arsenal, but you'll start to see how the variance of um, change from starting on the ground to standing could potentially help your workouts. And these warmups are good for straight, right before strength training, right before hikes, right before running, right before whatever you like to do. Because once again, it's a general preparation for the task at hand. And then last exercise I just want to show you in the cool down. I really like posterior hip stretches with hip turning. So a lot of times our hip will get tight if we sit a lot. So what I like to do is we like to swing the leg forward, and I'm going to show you from the side. And then we like to take the hip, I'll show you slightly angled there, and I like to drive it down towards that front knee while, while keeping my torso relatively straight. You're going to do a slight rotation, and then we really get that posterior hip right there that can get super tight, okay? Which is always good because people that tend to have lower back tightness and stuff like that, will some directly somehow be affected by their glutes in some way. So it's a very good stretch to do. So once again, always start from the ground if you can. Ideally, if you can use some foam rolling, some breathing, then really target certain regions, whether that's glute activation, whether that's some shoulder work to get kind of the smaller regions working well and warmed up, then 
create bigger patterns. Lunges, downward dogs, things that start to add multiple joints. So let's try and start with one to two joints, then expand it. So then you get the whole system working, then go to your running, or then go to your strength training, whatever it might be. So remember, don't forget about the, uh, the warm up, five to 15 minutes, and the cool down. Let your whole system come back down. 